couple of uh, <laughs> items that we have to talk about before we <coughs> concentrate on the topic for today. And you had one. Tell me. The other man would like to speak. Sorry. For the last tomorrow, the needing the rockets. Yeah. Since the, en er, the engine, they come in packs of three. Yeah. How many times are we going to be firing it once. just once? So we could split off the you engine. Could, you could sell the other ones at a profit, yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily at a profit, but I bought a pack of three, so. I uh, get together with people that uh, might need one. Now, uh, I said they only fly once. That's it, if everything goes well. Uh, I don't expect the camera to be a problem, but I do, but I'm not sure about that hole there. Uh, but I guess even if they don't make the hole, that would be your problem, not so much the film. So I think one, one flight is probably all right, unless you want to fly more than once. And then you uh, do the beginning ones, and then you go to the end. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, we need the engines, the igniters for the engines, the rocket. We don't need the actual platform. You don't the need the launcher, no. Okay. Um, and we also don't need the, the device to set off the igniter. No, okay. I, I will have that all set. And it's not mandatory, right? I mean, it is an option for you to participate in it or not. Uh, you can either launch, and, and I guess the option, I'll give you a bunch of options. Well, a couple. One of them is to participate and bring a rocket, and we do it. Uh, the other one is to, uh, is to, uh, maybe there's only two options. And uh, the second option is I give you a sample uh, result. So you don't have to launch anything. I just give you a result and say, well, this is what it is if you had done it. And then you go from there. Well, and I guess the third option is you just don't do it at all. You don't even write it up. Right? Because that could be one of your two that you don't do. Well, that, all of that is okay. Uh, just want to reiterate that... Uh, this is probably a little bit more uh, chancy than the than the bullets. The bullets are pretty safe, and uh, the rockets are pretty safe too. Uh, we've never had a, a, an accident, but on some of these walls, you can see a, a, like a black streak. I'm not sure if there is one. I think there was one over there, and that was caused by a rocket <coughs> coming down and then wiping its tail across the wall. Well, if it had been your face. Uh, that would have been pretty, pretty scary. It wouldn't have lasted too long. Pretty scary. Yes, sir. Is this just eye protection, or is just eye protection? Yeah, it's not loud. Yeah, and uh, I have a bunch of goggles over here. So if you have them, bring them. If not, then wear what you have. And then if you don't have one, just go outside. Any other questions? Is it digital? No. So, uh, good question. Is it digital? No. Uh, you, you have to bring film. 400 speed? Yeah, 400 speed typically is, uh, is a film that works. So, if we didn't get our own rocket, could we photograph someone else at the same time they're photographing it? Or nope, there's only one camera. Yeah, gotcha. okay. and, uh, and I tried to simulate. Uh, a situation pretty much the way it would be on a range. So you, you have your rocket, but somebody else flies it. Gotcha. And somebody else operates the camera. Well, let's see. Uh, I guess you can up, you can load the camera. That, get your rocket, load the camera, but somebody else runs the experiment. Gotcha. Um, and you trust that they do it okay. That's the way it goes on the, on the real end. I think we also need to talk about um, the optional final and the time that uh, that'll become available. How about Saturday morning at 10? Any objections? Saturday morning at 10 then? 
How long was it? Uh, probably two hours. Yeah, I don't know. Typically, an exam period, I'm not sure. I think they're making them like four hours now. But the typical exam is, uh, has a limit of two hours. And uh, so it should be able to be done. Uh, there are 200 questions, so. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, if history is anything to go by, and, and this is sort of like history, uh, you should be able to get done in two hours. Anything else? Yes. Sure, why not? Anything else? It is, uh, it is, uh, the final will cover everything from the very beginning. Probably a little more emphasis on the end, but uh, the, the beginning is not to be ignored. And as I said, it can't count against you. <coughs> But uh, if you don't take it, it won't add anything. And if you don't take it, the maximum is a C, correct? That's correct. Okay. So. And the minimum is a D. So I don't feel any more. And the reason for that is I have to fill out pieces of paper that say, you know, this person didn't, you know, this yeah. terrible person. I don't like to do that. So, I think that I've covered everything that we need to cover for tomorrow and Saturday. And uh, I have a, a handout here, a reprint. It's not the one that I wanted to give you because it is a refresher, sort of, uh, I think it is a refresher of uh, something that uh, we covered earlier. With the, with the two bullets, uh, but at least it will give you an idea of what a, uh, a professional presentation looks like related to a subject matter that we covered, which was street photography. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, reprint that I would have liked to hand out today, uh, I can't find. So I'll try to find it, and if I find it, I'll scan it and I'll put it online somewhere. Uh, I feel like this one's missing a couple pages. I'll uh, try to get another one. Okay. Yeah, give the one that's missing pages to somebody else. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let me guess you have three pages. You have three pages? Yeah, I have three pages as well. Ben has six. Some are single, some are double sided. Is that All right. right, I just don't get the cover then. I can deal without having the cover. I guess. Okay. <laughs> Though it's a very nice cover. Yeah, it is a nice cover. It has this nice, like, surface. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah. yeah. This is layer out. Oh, there may be extra. If you want to trade yours in later, I'll, I'll probably have a. I'll, I'll survive. <laughs> he has to. Okay, fine. <laughs> Who doesn't have this enough pages? I've got one more. So the topic for today and tomorrow is uh, something called synchroballistic photography. And uh, I think that you uh, probably have felt an undercurrent in the topics that we covered having to do with, uh, uh, best I can say, these military applications of, uh, of high-speed photography in particular. Ballistics and so on, they're all related to what some people call bad stuff. But uh, my opinion, and it's just my opinion, is that society wouldn't be where we, were, where we are today if it weren't for the bad stuff. If there were no wars, if there were no development in, in, in missiles and machines and killing things, uh, we would be way behind. Uh, probably the Internet wouldn't be around, and that might be a good thing. 
because it was designed to communicate between government agencies, right? And government agencies typically involved in, in sometimes not so uh, pleasant to think about activities. So uh, anyway, the, the way that, that, that all of these applications in, in, uh, in weaponry and military uh, situations came about was because I think I probably mentioned this before. I always wanted to be a range photographer. Somebody out there in the hot sun would photograph things blowing up and missiles flying and explosions and so on. That would have been great fun. Now, later on, I found out that that would not have been very great fun. Uh, but anyway, the mystique of uh, getting associated with uh, uh, that kind of activity uh, kind of uh, drove my own interest in developing uh, projects that had to do with it. And high-speed cameras and street cameras and uh, all the other things that we did, you know, stroboscopy and so on, were all related to, to that activity. Now, the ultimate uh, our project, uh, and the one that we're driving at today, has to do with realizing that uh, sometimes, uh, well, I wanted to say is you remember that, uh, that, that uh, there are trade-offs. That, that we talked about in, in high-speed photography. And, and ultimately, we always talk about, well, resolution and so on is, is, is the thing that suffers. Well, one of the objectives in uh, high-speed photography is to, is to end up with data that you can make uh, measurements from. Uh, you can determine how fast things move, how fast <coughs> they turn, how, how long they last, and so on. Uh, so. Uh, what one normally uh, jumps to as a tool of analysis is high-speed cameras, uh, just like that phantom over there. Oh, okay, well, you know, we'll run a camera 10,000 pictures per second or whatever, and it'll photograph this, and then we'll take all these pictures and we'll, we'll analyze it and uh, uh, end up with data. Well, in high-speed photography, probably the most tedious task that... that uh, people have is that of uh, analyzing a sequence of images. Cameras that come out of the phantom, for example, are individual frames. Okay, so while it might not be too, too difficult, and you, you'll experience this yourselves, in terms of figuring out how long things last, <coughs> you know, a framing rate, and you, you know the time between frames, and you count the number of frames, oh, okay, well, that's the amount of time. But sometimes things become more complicated when you say, well, how fast do they move? Uh, that, uh, you have to count individual frames, change the position, figure out the position. Uh, I must admit that there are uh, some smart <coughs> programmers have already written programs that allow you to do that almost automatically. They will track particles and spit out all kinds of information for you. But if you have to do it from scratch, you have a problem. So reducing the time from the time that a photograph is made or a sequence is made to the point where you can uh, arrive at meaningful data, uh, reducing that time is a desirable thing to do. So sometimes you may choose a different system than a framing system for individual pictures. And uh, that's where the, the process of uh, strip, strip photography uh, comes in. I think I mentioned that we were going to do something with strip photography early on when we talked about uh, street photography because the two systems are very related. And um, so this is the second half of, of an application uh, for moving film type or, or if you wanted to make it digital for uh, uh, a digital system that displays time as one of the dimensions in the final image. <coughs> Now, what does synchroballistic photography, I'm asking myself, what does synchroballistic photography, or how did it come about, and what does it have to offer? Well, one of the uh, limitations in uh, framing cameras, maybe, I must admit, probably not today, because now the framing cameras like this one uh, it can give you exposure times in the order of a millionth of a second, you know, sometimes even less. Uh, but of course, they require a lot, of, you know, a lot more light because the sensitivity is limited, and so on. So, uh, if you have a system, let's just imagine that you have a system that doesn't 
have a short enough exposure time to give you a sharp photograph of a moving object. In that case, uh, what do you do? Well, one of the things that you, that you do is, uh, is you record a moving image onto moving film. And that's what the rotating prism cameras do, right? Uh, so they have a moving image, they move the film at the same speed as the image moves, and out it comes. But that only works in one dimension. Actually, maybe that, now that I think of it, it doesn't work at all. Uh, it's action stopping really that you want for each frame. So um, I'm getting ahead of myself on that. But OK, so you can't uh, achieve a short enough exposure time. But you know, I guess from regular photography, that uh, if you pan the camera along with the action, the image remains stationary, or more or less so, on the film. and you can use a longer exposure time. Uh, sometimes it's not possible to pan a camera. And now you have a moving image. Uh, the way to overcome the fact that the image is moving is either by panning or by moving the recording material. Now I'm trying to translate that to digital. Uh, in the case of digital, uh, you uh, you don't translate anything. However, you look at one line of pixels over and over again. Right? And so si you simulate that the, uh, that the, that the camera is, is, uh, is moving something, but it's not. What it's doing is putting things in memory. Right? So, and I say so uh, reluctantly, because I think it's a bad mannerism. Uh, set up a system, uh, again, my favorite drawing here, of a slit. And either the, the slit or we can have a line of pixels, a linear array. If it's a linear array, this goes to some kind of a computer uh, or a gadget that reads out those lines over and <coughs> over. So it's a readout rate. Um, cameras like this do exist. Typically, for the government, uh, they're pretty expensive. Uh, they're used at racetracks. In fact, a couple of you came with me to, to uh, Finger Lakes, and we took, took a look at the photo finish operation. Uh, it's the same thing. They just look at this line over and over again. If it's film, in that case, the film can be made to move. And we'll, I may have mentioned this before, but I don't remember because I'm old. Uh, if this is digital, you could say this is unused memory. Right? The camera can, can use that. And this is used memory. Same thing. Uh, once you expose the film, it goes into storage, right? Well, you can take images off of here and push them into a computer, and eventually your storage is going to li reach a limit. Well, the same with film. Uh, it's kind of easier to, to look at a system which is human rather than electrons and protons and whatever they are. Uh, so thinking about the system as a film system, saying, well, I got, like film is going to move that way. And it passes a slit, it sees light, and it gets exposed. So uh, out here, uh, this camera, you know, there's a light type box, and there's a, a lens out here. And it forms an image on that slit. Well, what does it form an image of? Oh, just space. Okay. And the street camera system, it just looks looks at that <coughs> one line over and over again. And uh, if something happens, it gets recorded. Well, if, if what get, gets gets recorded, and I think I'll just go back to the earlier uh, situation here. Put a lamp here, and we light it up. Okay. And we let it light it up for a short time. In that case, eventually, end up with some kind of a street, right? The length of it, standing for the length of time that the lamp was on, assuming, well, relatively speaking, that's the case. Absolutely speaking, in order to determine time from this, you need to know what the recording rate was, if it's digital, or what the film speed was. You can, in either system, what you could do is you could include something over here, such as a flashing light source, and this would give you timing marks. And timing marks would say, well, the the time between those is some known amount. 
Without timing marks, information is all relative. With timing marks, it becomes absolute. And uh, as with the bullets, we saw that when the image moves, such as this, it moves. In that case, you end up with some kind of a diagonal line right? that we already covered. So now, what else can we do? Instead of having something on there that, that changes by itself or moves <coughs> along that, well, we can have an image that moves that way. And if we make these two arrows the same, okay, make that image and make that uh, film, or uh, the, the equivalent of what film would be in the digital realm by making the uh, capture rate uh, be such that in the time that it takes this object to move across that linear array, you, you record or you download the right number of lines so that the result ends up to be you know, a square. A square image ends up to be as a square reproduction. In the case of film, if you make these two the same, in that case, the reproduction will be something like this. How do you know that that's going to be, that's going to be the result? Well, when you think about this, you say, well, at this time, okay, I'm not recording anything, just background noise. But at some time, this square is going to reach that edge. Okay, and at that time, pixels or the film are going to say, hey, I can see some light. Not just the background, I can see light from something else. And from that time forward, this takes some time to go to the other side. And because the film is moving just as fast as the image is moving, you end up with a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the image that moved past and the uh, result that you get. You say, okay, well, what, what good is that? Well, by itself, all it gives you is a picture. Right? Uh, you could also imagine the, the fact that uh, you're not moving at the right speed, or you're not recording at the right speed. So this is moving at some rate, and this is moving twice as fast. Well, two lines, okay? Uh, two lines. Now, if the film is moving twice as fast as the image is moving, then you say, well, what, what's going to happen there? Well, it's going to take some time for this to go across. And remembering that time, you say, well, how long? How much recording material is going, go, going to pass underneath? Well, it's traveling twice as fast, so twice as much. So the result is going to be something like that. One to two instead of one to one. Right? And the opposite happens when the image moves faster than the film moves. Well, then you get a compression. If it's a, it's a half as fast, in that case, you know, it ends up to be the same height, but half as long. The objective is to, is to end up with a picture that looks like the original. A distorted picture, it turns out, is not a bad thing from a data point of view. But from a visual point of view, it's, it's kind of disconcerting. You say, oh, this thing is all stretched out. Yeah. It's useless. Well, it, it isn't. Because what you're interested in, typically, is how fast is, it, is this moving? Is the, the, the image moving? So, uh, a synchroballistic system essentially came about because uh, operations didn't have exposure times that were short enough to record fast, to record sharp pictures of fast-moving missiles. And somebody figured out that, oh, well, we don't need to use <coughs> short exposure times. We could just make a recording material, move as fast as the image of whatever it is that we're recording, missiles, and then we can use a relatively long exposure time. We don't need as much light. Uh, we don't need to go to a millionth of a second exposure time. We just need to keep the relationship between the speed of the film or the recording rate uh, the same as the rate at which the image passes by. And that's easier to do uh, than to get a real short exposure time. So these systems depend essentially on the fact that you know, there's an image out here and there's recording material back here. And they're tied together uh, as much as you can. And if you tie them together, you know, we walk together. So in relationship to each other, we're standing still. 
in relationship to everything else, we're moving. But we don't care about that. So ultimately, as, as you watch me pass here, you'll say, well, what can I learn? Or how can I, what can I learn about you moving here? Well, if, if you watch me pass here, you know, say, well, it took me so much time to go across this table. Now, that gives you some information about how, fa how fast I was moving, right? How long did it take me to go across the table? So on synchro ballistic cameras, the, uh, uh, just as in photo finish cameras, for those of you who saw those, uh, the important thing to remember, uh, if there is such a thing as an important thing, is, let's see if I can do this in a different color, so these are dying. Yeah, but this dimension here is time. And this dimension is distance. Is the record from a phantom time? Yeah. Instantaneous little bits of time. This is continuous time. Just like when we did the stroboscopy uh, experiment with the sewing machine. Now you put a, a tungsten lamp there to, to not lose put, uh, track of the position of that needle over time. Well, these cameras don't lose don't have a dark period, or these systems don't have a dark period. They look at the same line over and over again, and the, the film, more so than the digital, has, I mean, the digital still has time between scans. Okay. Kind of questionable for real high-speed events. Film does not. Okay. When it sees light, that's it. So these smart people at the uh, at the ranges figured out that uh, instead of using a camera like that, end up with all these pictures. What we're going to do is just use a camera where the film moves and end up with one picture, which will tell us something about the performance of a missile. So, uh, in fact, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. How? What are the parameters that you need to consider? I think uh, one of the things to remember, one well, of my things, my things to remember, but one of the things related to this uh, has to do with the fact that um, the photographs are made of images. They're not of the real thing. Okay? Uh, the recording material, the sensors, the film, it records light, which is gathered by lenses. Now, can you work backwards to the relationship between an image and the original object. I think you can. That's governed by something. Anybody know what it is? The relationship between an image and the and the subject. <coughs> optics. Yeah, no, optics, but more than optics. There's a particular factor involved. Magnification. Yeah. Yeah. If in doubt, say magnification. That ties the images together to the subjects. So if you find out something about how an image works, you can find out something about the object works if you know what the magnification is. The first order of approximation, magnification is typically, uh, there, there are a number of factors that, that determine it. Uh, how would you figure out what the magnification is of, uh, of, uh, of me, for example, inside of your camera. Measure your height compared to the height of the image. And then how, what would have the actual relationship be for magnification? Object over image. <coughs> no. The other way around. Image, image over object. Because you're always <coughs> making images that are, well, not always, right? Mm -hmm. But usually you make images that are smaller than your object. So your magnification tends to be fractional. It's one one hundredth, one two hundredth, and so on. I don't particularly like magnification. I like reduction better because I understand that's what happens. And then I, I don't have to deal with fraction. But anyway, uh, 
the cameras work with images. So they can, we can either concern ourselves a lot with what the subjects are or not. If we don't, in that case, we figure out magnification somehow. And then uh, compute something for images and then work to what the subjects were. So in the case of these rocketry people, what they had I'll have a missile of some kind. Uh, typically, these would be fired in a horizontal uh, orientation. A few times the speed of sound. We put the camera over here. In fact, uh, uh, on, a, on a ballistic range that looks at these things, uh, there would be a number of cameras. cameras. Uh, some of them might be framing cameras, uh, but some of them are going to be the synchro ballistic cameras. In the synchro ballistic cameras, uh, there's a lens here, and it looks at that space right there. And so we'll just use those for the sake of argument. And they look out there, and essentially it's a line, because inside of them, you know, there's a, that slit that restricts the horizontal angle view to a line, or there's a linear array which does the same thing. So let me take care of this. And here's another one. Now, if you're pretty close to this missile, in order to get a sharp picture of it, you need a short exposure time. With a single ballistic camera, you can kind of fudge it. I don't want to say fudge it, but you can fudge it by moving the film. And in a case like this, the missile is going that way, so the film would have to go that way. Because the image is coming in from the left, but the image is coming in from the right. Because right? it's upside down, reverse left to right. So in your synchro ballistic camera, uh, in the digital realm, it would just be a linear array and it's clocked. But in the film, which is easier to, to relate to, uh, you make the film move at the expected speed of the image. How do you know how fast the image is going to travel so that you can dial in? Well, I want to make the film in the camera uh, or the rate be some rate. Well, you got to know some, somebody has to tell you something about this missile. Say, well, we think that it's going to run, uh, you know, 5,000 feet a second. How do you know that? I don't know. You know, some smart engineer uh, predicted that. Now, this may or may not happen. But assuming that it, that is true, okay, that this is running, what, I just made that up, you know, 5,000 5, feet per second. It's about, uh, what, it's about uh, four times the speed of sound. Right? Uh, but in my abbreviation, it would be five times the speed of sound, because that calls the speed of sound a thousand feet a second. Right? It's not quite that. But it doesn't matter. We know what the missile's speed is. Well, how, how do we know what the image speed is? Anybody? Isn't it the object speed times magnification? That's right. Okay, Chris. Times n equal image speed. And once we know what the image speed is, you know, we have these fancy cameras that have a dial on it that says, you know, dial in that speed. So supposing that you are running at a magnification, let's say, of uh, 1 100, which not, would not be unusual, would it? Well, 100 inches, well, that's too much, down to 1 inch, because the camera, uh, it's a problem with the digital cameras. They all have different size sensors, but if we go with a, with what is called a full frame, okay, that's 24 by 36, and it's one inch by one and a half, roughly. So in order to get a one one hundredth magnification, your subject would have to be 100 inches tall, right? And you reduce it to one inch. 100 inches is uh, how many feet? Eight, eight something feet? 
8 times 12? 8 times 10 is, is 80 plus 2 96. times 8. That's 96, right? That's pretty close. It has to be 8 feet, maybe up to, up to about over there. So, you know, it might not be too bad. So once you do this, the image speed at 100 magnification is going to be 50 feet per second. <coughs> right? So you just dial in 50 feet per second, assuming that you can do that. Ah, but the missile might change speed between <coughs> this camera and that camera, right? And it'll probably speed up, right? Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. Typically, you know, they slow down. But there are some missiles that start out slow and then they put in the retros and they pick up speed. So every camera is going to have a different speed at which it's going to be set, depending on the predictions of the designer. The objective for every one of them is to match the uh, recording rate to the image rate at which the image moves. But if you don't, not everything is lost. Okay, you can still get information out of it. What this would allow you to do is to make images of the rocket that looked like the rocket it did at the time that it passed sequentially over in front of each one of these cameras. If you don't match, in that case, you'll get a stretched out rocket. Or you'll get a compressed rocket. If you're recording too slowly, well, it gets squished together. But if you're trying to find out how fast the rocket is moving, if that's your main concern, and maybe another concern might be to find out the performance of various objects that are on the rocket, like a gas tank, cap or something like that. If you can match the speed, in that case, all of these things are going to be sharp. There will be no blur and no distortion either, which is, while a distortion is not something typically that you get, uh, that you have to concern yourself with snapshot type photography, such as in the Phantom, uh, what you're more interested in is, is getting a sharp photograph. Distortion that may not be, uh, it's sort of a trade-off. But if you can match, you should be okay. So what happens? This camera is looking at that line, right? At this time, at the time, I guess, that you see on the board here, this camera is seeing nothing, right? It's just the background. Eventually, the missile gets here. At that point, the front end of the missile gets recorded. And then, with time, it passes further and further over. And these are all different times. Okay, this is the time equals zero. And this is uh, one, two, three, four, or something. Depending on how fast the image is moving. Or the missile is moving. And eventually, uh, you end up with, if, if it's film, and actually whether it's film or digital, you end up with a whole bunch of memory that has nothing on it. But somewhere along the line, there'll be an image. Like that, maybe. Along with this, there may be particles that are flying off. Uh, there, may be, uh, there may be things that open up the missile falls out of and so on. They're all moving roughly at the same speed. So this is the, your final product. And from this, let's say that you have a minimal task, and that is to determine how fast that missile was moving. Well, this is the image, how fast the real missile was moving. You know that you're operating or You need to keep in mind that what, what you will want to know something about magnification. And I think Glenn said it right. It, uh, magnification has to be as related to you know what what my size or 96 inches is reduced to the one inch frame of the camera. 
Well, in, in, in the same sense, uh, rockets need to, that, that fly in front of, front of these cameras, have operated at a particular magnification. And you can determine that, what that is if originally, if, you know, well, first of all, you assume that the rocket does not get deformed as it's flying. Yeah, it's highly unlikely. So what you do is, before you even fly it, you measure this. And you, you know, you measure it, and it turns out to be, well, it's 90, what did I say, 96 inches. Well, no, uh, we want it to go for 100, right? I think we're going to go for under production. So it's 100 inches tall, uh, 100 inches wide. This is an assumption. And uh, you say, well, OK. So what was the actual magnification? Well, if the rocket, if it's a 35 millimeter, you know what the frame size is, and you measure this from here to here, and that distance happens to be 20, 24, uh, in that case, for the recording rate to have been right, you would have had to have a missile that was this wide. You're reducing 100 inches to 1 inch. Obviously, in this case, we reduced the rocket more. So we probably weren't even running at 50, uh, whatever it was, 50 feet per second, right? So if you, if, uh, if, if, the mist, if you know that this distance is 24, you could estimate that that might be what? A sixth? How about a fifth? Of the, well, a sixth would be nice because a fifth is kind of screwy. Well, I know. So, uh, in that case, from here to here, if it's if it's a sixth, <coughs> this is four millimeters, right? Okay. Well, now I'm mixing inches from millimeters. That's, that's weird. So I have, I have an image which is four millimeters wide. The rocket itself was 100 inches, right? and reduced to four millimeters. So magnification is four millimeters divided by 100 inches. It's 25.4, it's 254, 2,500, millimeters. So that's the magnification. So uh, I don't know what, what that is. I can turn it upside down and it was what, six? 600? Something? Would that be about right? Yeah. 750, I think, is close. Yeah, yeah seven, well, about 7 times 4 is 28. And that would take me above that, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. So it would have to be 6 uh, and, six and change. And change, right. Yeah, 6. So I'm operating here. The missile is flying 500, what did I say, 5,000 feet per second. So in this case, if I'm operating at this, well, again, it's a screwy number. Uh, it'll be, I only need to run the film 600 times slower than that. So take two out of there, take two out of there. So uh, divide 50 divided 6 is. Uh, I can do that. Uh, eight. Right? Six times that's 48, almost 50. So anyway, I can run the film just at eight feet per second. That's pretty slow. And this thing is moving 5,000 feet a second. But I've reduced the image size to a very small image. So that image is not moving too fast. I can match that with film. Uh, just for the sake of argument, because see, I'm not always sure of myself. Uh, and I think that's a good thing to do, to be. You know, never be 100% uh, sure. And 100% sure has to do with the fact that, you know, as I look at this thing, 5,000 feet is fast, that's pretty fast. It's five times the speed of sound. And I reduce it 600 times. Hmm. 5,000 
feet per second. I'm dividing that by uh, 60, right? Or I think I did something wrong. Oh no, well this is feet per second. Yeah, and I divided by 60 because I knew that that, well my magnification was, this is, no it wasn't 60. It went from, uh, from 100 inches. So my magnification really was a 60, right? So I divide this by, yeah, 60. And if I take 5,000 divided by 60, it's not 8. I'm uneasy about this. I don't think it's 60. Shouldn't it be 635? Oh, that's right. Well, we did say that it was 600, and then I kind of screwed yeah. with it, right? Yeah, so, so this is. It's 7.8 or something. Right, right. Yeah, so it, it does come out because now we do have 50 divided by 648. Uh, six, 50 by 6 is 8, 8 feet per second. So I guess it's not bad. Right? But check me out. You know, I, I do this pretty fast off the top of my head. I don't know. I shouldn't say I don't know. And uh, I think the bottom line is you should have a gut feeling for how things work. Whether you get precision, precision is very important, but if you don't know where things are or where they're supposed to be, yeah, precision doesn't do any good. It's like looking at a calculator and looking at the 15 decimal places, you know, and saying, well, that's, that's good. Take 100 divided by 10, and you get 1. Yeah, you got feelings to say, hey, no, it's not right, right? Okay, so 8 feet a second. Well, we can do that. So, um, now we, we got this piece of film, and it's got an image of this rocket on here. And uh, 8 feet per second. Well, 8 feet is equal to what? Now, we already said that, 96 inches, right? And uh, so it's 96 inches per second. So if that's the case, in that case, we can say, well, one inch is equal to 1 96th of a second, right? So then we take this record here, where the rocket is 4 millimeters tall, and along the horizontal, we put in one inch marks. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. We put the one inch marks because we're going to mark off every one of them as being one ninety sixth of a second. Yeah, one ninety you know, it's a kind of screwy number, one ninety sixth. Wouldn't it be much easier to go for four hundred? Yeah. You can do that. Okay, but one one hundredth is going to be slightly shorter than one inch, right? If one inch is... Yeah. So anyway, we include, or, or knowing how fast the recording material is recording, film, we can include timing marks now. In the case of digital, it would be the same. You simply need to know how fast was the digital camera looking at that line. What was the recording rate? In film, it's a little easier to relate to. So you put these marks on it, an inch wide, each one is a 96th of a second. Again, this dimension, time. It's not something that you can measure with inches. It's something that you measure with a clock. This dimension, you can measure with a ruler. This dimension, while you may measure it with a ruler, you're actually measuring seconds and hours milliseconds. So now you take a look at this rocket and you say, well, you know, the back end is over here, the front is over here. The record started when the front got somewhere. Okay, so there we saw, that at this time, we saw the tip of the rocket. And at this time, we saw the back end of the rocket. How far did the rocket move? however long the rocket was, right? So if I have this table here, okay, 
and I put a stop for something here, and the table moves past here, it'll take some time for the table to move past this line. Right? Now, how far did the table move in the time that it took, took it to travel its own length? Well, I already gave you the answer. It traveled its own length, right? It's the same here. We only get a picture of this rocket because at one time the front end was at this lit or at the array, and at the other time the back end was there. So it traveled however long it was. So if you measure it at the beginning, do whatever, it could be 50 feet. It doesn't matter. You say, well, it took it. 196, 2, 3, 4, screw your number, 4.596 of a second to travel how far? 50 feet. How do you know for 50 feet? Well, because you measured the rocket beforehand, so you knew how long it was. And then this becomes the velocity of, of the rocket itself, because you're giving the dimension, not in terms of an image, but in terms of a real rocket. Now, what about exposure time? Well, what, what makes this attractive in terms of uh, uh, high-speed systems? Well, exposure time can be rather long if you match this two speeds. So it, exposure time depends on, yeah, no, I know, I don't know how in a digital realm it'll, it'll uh, uh, work out, but in a film uh, world, it, it depends on how wide the slit is. So if the slit is this wide, it'll take film some time to go from here to there, and that's exposure time. You want a short exposure time? Well, you make the openings smaller. Making the opening smaller that comes with trade-offs. It's a shorter exposure time, but now I need more light. You don't get much for nothing. In the digital realm, uh, there are no slits, but there is the array. That requires a certain amount of light to get a proper record, too. So, um, so what? But there are things that this rocket can do, or, or data that you can generate from a, a picture like, a synchroballistic picture like this, that uh, you can also generate from uh, a sequence of, of frames, okay? And let's take a look at how that might work. Still have a rocket to begin with. And it's got the fins over here, it's got the exhaust over here. But now we'll take a look at this rocket at various times uh, along the length of it. So <coughs> we'll put a, a time here, a time here. These are all times at which those lines on the rocket arrive at the array or at the slit of the camera. At this time, if we look at the rocket coming at us, we would see the tip of it, the cylindrical part of it, and um, we'll put a we'll put a line on the original rocket. Okay. And so at this time, we'll look at it, and the line looks like this. At this time. The line looks like that. Well, maybe that's too, too severe. And at this time, the rocket has looks like this. This time it looks like that. And this time it looks like that. So as you look at the sequence of images, you know, this would be the rocket in a framing camera coming at you. 
you see the line horizontal and higher, higher. You could determine what the, you know, it's rotating, right? Could you determine the rate at which it's rotating? Yes. Well, it could have gone multiple directions. Ah, that's a, very, that's a very good point, because you have the dark time. And you don't know the direction either. And you don't know the direction, but if I tell you it's coming right at you. No, I mean the direction of rotation. Oh, that's, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could, it could be going all the way around, right, from here all the way to there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be making a, one rotation in the sump. Or it could just be incrementing in the right direction. But from these, you know, if it's a framing camera, like that one, you have this frame. The rocket looks like that. Well, assuming that it didn't make more than one rotation, <coughs> it turned 45 degrees in that time, right? So this is your delta T, right? And that is your delta position, right? So delta position divided by delta T is equal to rotation rate. I think that works. If it turned 45 degrees, and I know that this is a thousandth of a second, okay, 45 degrees, am I looking at it in a thousandth of a second? Oh, come on. That tells me that it's turning 45,000 degrees per second. Right? It's falling off a lot. But you have to take a look at the two frames. Measure this one, measure that one. It takes time. What will the synchroballistic record look like? <coughs> no, probably, uh, if we look over here, you know, the line would be right here. And this one, the line would be up there. And this one, the line would be up there. And of course, now it goes to the back. Uh, but if we could see the back, in that case, in this one, the line would be over here, then it would be over here, and then it would be over here. Okay? So on this, we have a line. Uh, well, let's start from here and go up to there, and then we'll go to the back. And on the back side, come down like that. See the curved line. Okay. Can you determine rotation rate from this? Yeah, just like you could from this. You pick some. You pick some location. You say, "Oh no, you know, what's a good location?" Well, the one where the line is facing you. How about this one? So you say, "I want that time." Now pick another location. What's a good one? Oh, it's right at the top, right? So you pick that time. Well, how far does the rocket turn in that? This is your delta t, right? In the time that it took the rocket to go from here to here, it turned 45 degrees. Uh, actually, 90, 90 degrees, right? Yeah. Right. So 45 to there. So can you get the same information out of this that, that you could out of that? Yeah. But this is a distorted photograph. If somebody says to you, on that rocket, we had a straight line. And it turns out to be like a curved line. Well, something is screwed up. Your camera didn't work. You're playing with Photoshop. You say, no, no, no. I can determine the same thing that I could from a couple of frames here that I can determine from a single photograph when it's made in the synchroballistic way. Let's go a little bit further. So the rocket now is traveling in a straight line. Well, it's traveling to the right, but um, what am I going to do this? I guess I have to do it this way. At one time, it's like this. Another time, it's like that. Another time, it's like this. Uh, my drawing skills fail me here. Another time, it's like this. And, and another time, it might be like that. So the rocket is tumbling, right? It's not very safe. But for something like this, 
if you have these vertical lines on the rocket, and the rocket is, in fact, traveling straight, just changing position, in that case, you'll end up with an image of this rocket. Uh, the edges are not going to be quite the way I drew them because, obviously, it's growing in size, too, right? But you'll have to uh, bear with that. Load lines will record on an angle, right? It depends. In, in this case, the rocket actually was like this, right? And over here, it was like that. Well, because you know, you, oh, sorry, won't you no longer see the outline of the <coughs> rocket then? Because if it's tumbling through the slit, you won't see that nice shell anymore. It, right. Uh, that's what I meant. That I actually what I meant is my drawing skills on that are uh, uh, suspect. Because obviously, when the rocket is like this, you know, you, you, the edge of the rocket is not going to be the same width as the rocket itself. It's going to be real wide over here, and you and as skinny as it can get over here. However, uh, if, if the, I guess this is a big if, if the uh, rotation is not severe, in that case it won't look much different. And if the, uh, so you should be able to tell, well, it, well it, it, it's tumbling in one direction, or if the lines are lined up in the other way, then it's tumbling in the opposite direction. So you can tell something about tumbling. You can tell something about the speed. You can tell whether the speed is constant. You make these lines equidistant from each other. Right? And if at one point they're far apart, and the other place they're close together, in that case you can tell whether they're far, far apart, the rocket is moving real fast. Right? <coughs> Wrong. It's the other way around. You've got to think relative here relative speed between images and the recording material. So things that are moving too fast, they end up to be small. Things that are moving slow end up to be stretched out, assuming some particular recording. If the rocket moves straight, but let's say it drops in height as it goes across, in that case, now you end up with a rocket that kind of looks like this. Uh, the lines, the lines will be all straight, right? But the rocket is going to be tipped. And in this case, the rocket is rising, yeah, because as it goes through, the tail end is higher. Could you get that from a framing camera? Sure, you could. But you have to take one frame and compare it to the next frame, compare it to the next frame. This gives you that information all in one shot. And not only that, it gives you, a, it should anyway, give you a sharp photograph of this fast moving event using a relatively long exposure time, which is very efficient as far as light use is concerned. And the data reduction is minimal. What are the drawbacks? People who don't understand what you did are going to be confused. So as long as you're not showing them a distorted picture, everything is fine. But the minute you start to show distortion, uh, then you have to then you have to uh, rely on on being able to explain away what it is that happened. So synchro ballistic uh, cameras are used at ballistic ranges even today. Um, they are an adjunct to the framing cameras. And because I thought this was a cool thing that they did out there in ballistic land, I thought that we ought to have something like that here. So uh, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. But uh, for tomorrow, I will prepare you with uh, what we are actually going to be photographing and how we're going to make decisions about the operation of the synchro ballistic camera uh, after we take a little break. But before we take a break, I'll ask you the, the perennial question. Are there any questions? Okay. <coughs> I'll see you in a few minutes.